Good morning again. Uh, welcome back to a new week. Uh, before we begin, would anyone like to open us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the time of class we are about to have. God, we just pray uh, that you will help us to understand more about who you are, more about what you have did for us as we are listening to the classes uh, that will in, uh, bring a transformation in our mind about the revelation of who you are, Jesus. God, I just pray uh, and I bless with them and in the name of Jesus. Be with her. Uh, fill her with your wisdom and knowledge as she's uh, teaching the class to us, Jesus. And God, I pray for good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session. Let there be no disturbance. Let this be a time where we get equipped in your work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. So um, we will just do a small recap of all that we covered last week and then go into this week's content. Um, so last week we covered from, um, let me just find the exact passages from 8.4 to 10.4. Chapter 8, verses 4 to chapter 10, verses 4. Um, Jafina, would you like to take us through whatever we covered? Yeah, uh, so in verse 4, uh, in chapter 8, verse 4, we saw how uh, the Trinity was mentioned in one verse, the Father, the Son, everything was mentioned in the verse, we saw that. And uh, in verse, maybe chapter 9, verse 3, we saw that Jesus was being the means uh, for all the creation and how an idol cannot bring things into existence, but uh, we have a God in whom there is life who brings things into uh, extensions. And we also saw uh, the difference of Jews and the Gentiles, the distinctions they had between the rich and the poor, how they, uh, how the poor didn't get, uh, actually the poor actually depends on the temple to get meat. I think that's one of the things that you mentioned. Uh, so that's one of the reasons they wanted to know whether uh, they can eat uh, the food from the temple uh, or not. And uh, we saw they get food from two places, the temple and in the marketplace. Um, and one of the things that I understood as we were uh, reading the scriptures and listening to the classes is there are verses that says even our knowledge can destroy. Uh, someone when we have too much when our knowledge is puffed up that can destroy someone's faith uh, and that's why uh, our knowledge uh, should be covered with love every time whatever we learn uh, whatever we impart into people uh, we should do it uh, out of love and in chapter 9 we saw uh, Paul's role uh, as an apostle we saw the three categories of apostle um, and then uh, we saw Paul talking about being a servant of Christ. Uh, we saw his sacrifice, his stewardship, uh, his self-discipline. Uh, and we saw uh, how Paul was uh, asking a question and then answering it. He said, am I not an apostle? Uh, I have the power and authority. He said, am I not free? Uh, my service is pure. Um, and have I not Jesus Christ? Uh, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And he remembered that he had an encounter with God. And uh, are you not okay with my work with Lord? You, we see the fruit of his work. So he was answering all the questions that was placed upon him. And uh, we also saw that uh, an action or mm, muzzle while it's straight out of the grain. So. Uh, we just saw the expressions of it and we just saw that we should always choose uh, the spiritual things over 
the material things um yeah i think there are so many things that we saw like this uh so paul was explaining how we can willingly uh work and unwillingly also we can work as a stewardship of god uh so when we willingly work we get the reward for it and sometimes we just unwillingly work we just want to be uh obedient and uh, uh we saw that there is a freedom from jewish law but paul still chose to be a slave uh, to god's law and uh, he became the lower class to uh, share the gospel to the lower class so then he he was ready to change in any form just so that uh, the gospel uh, can be shared and um, we also saw that we should not run without a specific purpose uh, and when we do the act of service we should always see there is a transformation how is our stewardship what are the sacrifices we are doing and we should always willingly uh, enter into the world whenever we serve someone and we should have that self governing uh, ability and we saw how it all uh, is related to the idol worship in chapter 8 what is the real relation and we saw that paul was ready to give uh, talking about give up giving up on the rights giving up uh, on the freedom being a jew for the jew and that all helps us to relate it with idol worship so yeah i think that's it thank you jefina uh so yes so we just covered those uh, two chapters um uh, the one where paul specifically addresses idol uh, eating foods offered to idols uh, that is in chapter 8 and in chapter 9 he talks about uh, his own life as uh, an example uh, and talks about how he has given up his own rights he's given up uh, things uh, that he could easily claim for himself uh, for the sake of the gospel and so he's encouraging uh, these christians in the church of corinth uh, saying for the sake of the gospel it's worth giving up certain things and in this case he's talking about uh, eating food sacrificed to idols um so from there we'll continue in chapter 10 uh, we did start a little bit with chapter 10 last week i think we covered the first four verses uh, so we will continue from there um let's just take a quick look yeah maybe uh, we can just uh, start from the beginning of chapter 10 uh would someone be willing to read 10 verses 1 to 14 please chapter 10 verse 1 moreover brethren i do not want you to be unaware of that all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea all were baptized into moses in the cloud and in the sea all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was christ but with most of them god was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted and do not become idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23000 fell nor let us tempt christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer now all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man but god is faithful 
who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. Thank you, sister. So we see uh, what we covered last week in the first few verses. Uh, Paul uses the example of the uh, history of the Israelites, uh, talking about their um, exodus from Egypt and their uh, wandering in the wilderness until they reached the promised land. Uh, so while they were in the wilderness, Although God showed all of them the same miracles, God led them uh, the same way. Every one of them saw the pillar of cloud. Everyone saw the pillar of fire. Everyone went through the Red Sea. All of them had um, God's uh, provision of food and water. In all of these things, uh, yet um, most of them, so all of them saw these miraculous things, but most of them didn't enter the promised land. Uh, right, that whole first generation of people who left Egypt uh, all died in the wilderness. And it was the next generation uh, with Joshua and Caleb who entered the promised land. Uh, so he's saying, don't think that just because you are in the church, just because you are seeing miracles uh, and you have been baptized, uh, just because you have gone through all of this and you are uh, re receiving scripture, you are taking part in uh, things in the church, don't think that that is what is going to take you uh, till that final destiny in the presence of God. Uh, that is uh, not your assurance. Your assurance is where you uh, walk in obedience to God. And so he's, uh, he continues to uh, mention some of the things that the Israelites did that were against God. And then he says, make sure you don't fall in the same ways that these people fell. Um, so we'll go on to verse 6. Now, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. So he gives a few examples here of things that the Israelites did. So one was they lusted. Um, they were idolaters. They committed sexual immorality. They tempted God or they tested God. They complained. Uh, right? So... Uh, these are some of the things he mentions that they did. And uh, these were the things that uh, made God upset with them. And these were the things that brought judgment on them. Um, so we we'll look at each of these things. So verse 6 talks about the lust for evil things. Um, we'll also read uh, the references that are mentioned there. So Numbers 11, 4, 5, and 34. So Numbers chapter 11, verse 4. 5 and 34. Would someone be willing to read that for us? Um, chapter 4 verse um, Numbers 11, Numbers chapter 11. Verses 4, verse 5, and verse 34. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense cra craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? 34. So he called the name of that place Kibrot Hatava because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. Thank you. So, yes, in verse 5, we, 4, we see that uh, the 
there were a diff there was a mixed group of people who had left Egypt. It was not only uh, Israel. So they say um, the rabble with them or the mixed group of people with them started to long for other foods. And so when those people started to cry out for uh, meat, the Israelites joined in with them. And um, we see in verse 5, they say, we remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Right? So uh, they are looking back at their time as slaves and looking at it as if it was a memory that they cherish uh, because of the meat that uh, they enjoyed there, which they're not able to have now in the wilderness. So uh, the problem was not that they wanted meat. There was nothing wrong with wanting meat, but it was that they were asking for meat uh, at a time when God had provided other things and they were asking for it, not, they were not asking for it, they were complaining and uh, also uh, looking um, at their time in Egypt as something uh, that they wanted to hold on to. When God had saved them and rescued them from Egypt, they, they still wanted to hold on to that. Uh, for something as uh, insignificant as meat, right? So uh, they would rather be slaves in Egypt and eat meat than be free in the wilderness without meat. Uh, that's that's what they're saying here. Uh, and so uh, uh, God then brings judgment on them. He does provide the meat, but then uh, all of those who... Uh, have yielded to that craving or to that lust for meat uh, are under judgment and all of them actually die. So this is one of the group of people who die in the wilderness. Um, we'll see in the next verse, chapter, uh, verse 7, it talks about uh, those who worshipped idols. So uh, do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Um, so if someone can read that Exodus 32 verses 1 to 8. Exodus chapter 52, verses 1 to 8. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke up the golden earrings which were in the ears and brought them down. And he received the gold from there and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And Lord said to Moses, Go, get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. So uh, here we see that uh, Moses had gone up the mountain to meet with God and to uh, receive God's covenant with the people. And when he's gone, the people uh, get tired of waiting for Moses. They think he's not coming back. And so uh, they decide to make a God for themselves instead of waiting for, uh, for Moses to come back with God's word to them. And um, in this time, they actually make 
their idol with the very things that God had blessed them with, right? When they were leaving Egypt, all of the jewelry that they got was God's favor upon them, uh, that the Egyptians gave them uh, so much jewelry, gave them so many things as they were leaving, as they were coming out. And so these very same things that God had blessed them with, they've used now to make an idol. Um, so uh, it's important even for us when we are in a time of uh, maybe not hearing from God very clearly or not seeing God move in our lives in a way that we are wanting him to move or expecting him to move uh, for us to just stay faithful in those times because it's very tempting for us to go and resolve the situation for ourselves. Uh, we see that also in the life of Abraham who uh, God promises that he will have a descendant but Abraham decides to find his own solution to that. Uh, in um, taking Hagar and having uh, a child with her. And um, so we can come up with our own solutions sometimes uh, that are completely against God's will. And so it's important in these times of waiting to just keep trusting in what God has told us uh, last, whatever he has promised us, whatever he has commanded us, to just stay faithful to that, to keep believing him, uh, believing those promises, to keep declaring those promises and waiting through those times of inactivity or silence uh, to uh, see God fulfill what he has said uh, in his own time, in his perfect time. Let's go to verse 8. Uh, so from idolatry, he then gives us an example of sexual immorality and he says, let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Uh, this is from Numbers 25, uh, verses 1 to 9. Would someone read, read that for us, please? Numbers 25. Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, even one of every one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal of Peor. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. So here we see... Uh, the example of sexual impurity. So um, before this is where um, uh, the king of Moab calls Balaam, calls him to uh, come and pronounce a curse on the people of Israel. And Balaam tries three times to pronounce a curse. But uh, every time uh, he tries to do that, instead the words that come out of his mouth are words of blessing. Uh, so he recognizes that God has blessed these people and he cannot uh, overpower God's blessing that is already upon them. And so uh, he chooses another way to bring them uh, or to cause them to fall. And that is to uh, bring in the temptation of women, to bring in the temptation of uh, sexual sin. And he tells the king of Moab uh, that this is the way to make these people fall. And uh, so through the women of Moab, uh, the Israelites are tempted and they are 
drawn away not only to the women but also to their gods and um and so god's judgment again is upon these people they have abandoned god and they have uh, gone after uh, gone after these foreign women and their gods uh, so we look at the last example and then we look at why Paul is actually bringing up all of these things in this context uh, that he's talking about. So verse 9 says, Now let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Uh, so the uh, this is in reference to Exodus 17, 7, uh, where uh, what is recorded is they tested or they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Uh, and uh, later on, we see uh, the other uh, the other reference of uh, being uh, being bitten by snakes, right? So that's uh, Numbers twenty one four to six. Uh, let me just pull up that. Sorry, I'm not sure if that actually tells the whole story. Okay, no, Numbers 21 is just the time that they complain about not having water. And yes, uh, they speak against God. And uh, and they ask Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Uh, and then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. Um, so we see here again um, that word of tempting uh, God or tempting Christ means to test God or to question him, to question his purposes, to, uh, to question his goodness uh, and to wonder, is he really there? Is he really faithful to uh, do what he has said he will do? Um, and so it is when they were questioning God this way that they were testing God or asking God to prove himself. And God had already uh, walked with them through the wilderness, led them through so many things, uh, to then turn back and question God and say, are you really there? Are you really uh, going to provide for us? Are you really going to take care of us? Uh, was uh, to not acknowledge what God had already done. Right. God had already been so faithful, but they had they were not acknowledging any of that. Uh, they were only uh, focused on that current situation and the challenge they were facing at that time. And they couldn't remember God's faithfulness in the past. Uh, so that is something for us to learn as well. When we are in times where we are challenged, where we are facing some kind of uh, discouragement, how can we remember God's faithfulness in the past and trust that he will continue to be faithful even through the present challenges that we are facing. Uh, we do not, we should not uh, question or doubt God's goodness just because at this present moment we don't have exactly what we need. Uh, because we know that God has been faithful, he will continue to be faithful. That is his nature, that is his character. Uh, and then verse 10 says nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer um, so here we uh, see about uh, the israelites grumbling against both uh, moses and aaron and also against uh, against god because uh, God had chosen Moses and Aaron to lead them. So when they were complaining about their leaders, they were complaining about God as well. Um, so that is important for us also to recognize that the leaders God has given us are people whom he has entrusted with this responsibility. And so we should honor our leaders and we should be careful about what we say about them. Uh, so it was in this complaining and murmuring that judgment came upon the people of Israel as well. So why are all of these examples stated here? Um, lust for evil things, idolatry, sexual immorality, uh, tempting Christ, complaining and murmuring. Right? All of these things can be connected to what the Corinthian church uh, 
was doing or what they were uh, what they were facing in the church. Uh, the first thing is the last for evil things. So as the Israelites were asking for meat in the wilderness, uh, what they were saying is this meat is more precious to us than our, um, our salvation from Egypt. Right? So this is a similar thing to what the Corinthian church was saying. They were saying we'd rather eat uh, the meat sacrificed to ideals than protect the salvation of our brothers and sisters. So if it's going to cause someone to fall, someone to fall away from their faith or to enter into sin, it's OK if, uh, as long as I'm able to eat my meat. Right? So elevating that, uh, that satisfaction of our fleshly desires over salvation, over uh, the gift of salvation that comes from God. Uh, the second thing was idolatry. So they wanted uh, in the among the Israelites, they explicitly worshipped the idol, right? They made an idol and they worshipped it. But in the Corinthian church, uh, although they may not have been going and standing for the idol, by taking part in this uh, food sacrifice to idols, they were honouring the gods that had been worshipped with that food, that that food had been sacrificed to. So they were taking part in the worship of those idols. And so that's why Paul is stating this example of idolatry. Um, the third is sexual immorality, uh, which is what Paul has talked about previously in the letter. Uh, one of the issues that he addresses uh, in the Corinthian church is sexual immorality. And so he's saying, uh, just as the Israelites uh, came under God's judgment because they, uh, they took part in sexual sin, uh, this is something for you to be careful about. This is a warning to you that you cannot, um, you cannot dishonor God and dishonor your bodies uh, by taking part in sexual sin and expecting that you will still, uh, you will still receive that full salvation and be in the presence of God when Christ comes back. So uh, calling them to reflect on what happened to the Israelites, that they did not enter the promised land because of one of the reasons was sexual sin. Uh, the fourth is tempting Christ, or testing God. Uh, so again, to tell them not to uh, not to test God or question God, uh, rather to uh, be obedient to His word and to trust Him. And the fifth, complaining and murmuring. So don't complain against your leaders, which again is what the, uh, in some ways, the church was doing, right? When they were saying, I follow Apollos, I follow Paul, uh, they were uh, putting down one leader, raising up another leader. And so again, here, this is the uh, reminder from Israel's history that when they complained and murmured against uh, Aaron and when they complained against Moses, uh, God was not pleased with them, with them, with their behavior. So uh, Paul is taking these examples from Israel's history and connecting it to exactly what the Corinthian church was dealing with. Um, if we read Psalm 106, uh, it's actually a beautiful summary of everything that happened in uh, the wilderness. I'll just read parts of it. Um, I'll read from verse 6 onwards, Psalm 106. We have sinned even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, to make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. But they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. In the desert, they gave in to their craving in the wilderness. They put God to the test. So he gave them what they asked for but sent a wasting disease among them. In the camp, they grew envious of Moses and of Aaron, who was consecrated to the Lord. The earth opened up and swallowed Dathan. It buried the company of Abiram. 
fire blazed among their followers, a flame consumed the wicked. At Horeb, they made a calf and worshipped an idol cast from metal. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt, miracles in the land of Ham, and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. So he said he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to keep his thoughts from destroying them. Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his promise. They grumbled in their tents and did not obey the Lord. So he swore to them with uplifted hand that he would make them fall in the wilderness, make their descendants fall among the nations and scatter them throughout the lands. They yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to lifeless gods. They aroused the Lord's anger by their wicked deeds, and a plague broke out among them. But Phineas stood up and intervened, and the plague was checked. This was credited to him as righteousness for endless generations to come. By the waters of Meribah, they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them. For they rebelled against the Spirit of God, and rash words came from Moses' lips. Okay, we we'll, uh, so oh, that was up to verse 33, and then we'll continue from verse 40. Therefore the Lord was angry with his people and abhorred his inheritance. He gave them into the hands of the nations, and their foes ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them and subjected them to their power. Many times he delivered them, but they were bent on rebellion, and they wasted away in their sin. Yet he took note of their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake he remembered his covenant, and out of his great love he relented. He caused all who held them captive to show them mercy. So um, we see actually this is a beautiful summary of everything that Paul has shared. It's almost like he's gone back to Psalm 6, and uh, those main points or the points he brings is Psalm 106, sorry, and he brings up all of these same points in this chapter. Uh, and the point of Psalm 106 is to say, to recollect everything that God had done uh, for the Israelites and how the Israelites had sinned against uh, God. Right? So God had been faithful, but they had forgotten God. They had abandoned God. They had strayed away from God, and they had prostituted themselves. Uh, uh, with other gods. So they had gone and worshipped other gods and left uh, the God who rescued them from Egypt. And so in the same way, Paul is calling these people uh, back to, to uh, Christ. He's saying, don't, uh, don't choose other things over Christ. Don't choose that meat offered to idols. Don't choose uh, sexual sin don't lust after other things because all of these things are idolatry all of these things uh, will uh, take you away from god and are elevating uh, you are elevating these things above god himself when you do things that are not in line with god uh, god's desires for you and for the church um, and so uh, from here he goes on uh, to verse 12 and says, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So don't be so confident in yourself or don't be so, um, so assured that you are okay, that you are right before God. Uh, but watch yourself, judge yourself, examine your own heart. Uh, make sure that you are walking in line with God, because if you don't do that, then you will fall. Uh, so it's a reminder for us to, to um, never come into a place of pride about where we are spiritually, uh, right? To, uh, that was something that we see among the Corinthians about them boasting in their leaders, boasting in their spiritual freedom, uh, boasting in their knowledge. There was so much pride in the church. And so as believers, it's very easy for us to come into a place of pride, especially the longer we've known Christ, the longer we've uh, been in faith. Uh, it's very easy to come to a place of pride. So to always uh, take a posture of humility, to always 
be dependent on Christ and recognize uh, that we need him and uh, to be in a place of obedience and submission to Christ is important. Um, we'll continue, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So uh, everything that comes to us, we know that God also makes a way for us to escape it. Uh, there's no temptation where there's no escape for us. Like there is no other way for us to get out but to give in. There's never going to be a temptation like that. Um, so uh, temptation uh, could be any form of testing, any trial that comes uh, to us. Sometimes it may be in, uh, in uh, trouble or some kind of hard situation that we are facing. Uh, other times it might be just um, a desire, something that is drawing us to do something that is against God. Uh, so it may be the challenges we are facing or that kind of uh, uh, something that's drawing us away from God. Uh, so in either of these cases, there will always be a way of escape or a way uh, where we can um, turn away from the sin and turn to God. And so that is something for us to remember that when we are in when we are faced with temptation we can run through the exit and we can resist uh till that temptation comes to the uh, to the end so that temptation will end it's not going to be there forever so we can keep resisting satan we can keep resisting the temptation uh till that time of testing comes to an end Um, verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Um, so uh, all of these sins actually are a, a form of idolatry because they're all taking us away from God, right? So uh, whether it's sexual immorality, whether it is uh, eating food, sacrifice to idols, uh, all of these things are... Uh, if we choose them over God, then it is idolatry. Uh, but Paul emphasizes idolatry here because he's going to take us back to that uh, topic of food sacrifice to idols. So he uh, talks about it from the perspective of idolatry uh, specifically. Um, so let's go on to verses 15 to 18. I think we just have a few minutes. Maybe we can just start with it and then we'll take a break uh, when it's time. Can someone read verses 15 to 18 for us? I speak as to wise men, judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh, are not those who eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? Thank you. So, here he's um, in verse 15, Paul is um, kind of reminding them, you have wisdom, uh, you are wise people, so you can judge what I'm saying. Uh, it's not that you are unable to see truth from falsehood. Right? So, uh, so he reminds them, you have this wisdom, uh, so you make a judgment as to what I'm saying, whether it's true or whether it's false. And then he uh, gives us gives him the example of uh, the Lord's table. Uh, so the cup of blessing which we bless is it not a communion? Uh, so he's here uh, reminding them of the significance of uh, the Lord's table uh, when we are partaking in it, when we are uh, having uh, the cup of blessing that is the wine. Uh, we are sharing in, or we are participating in, we are receiving the full blessings of the cross. Um, 
So how is this done? We first uh, bless that cup, right? So the cup of blessing is uh, it's a blessing that we receive through the blood of Christ, uh, which we bless. So there's a blessing that is spoken over the cup and then we partake in it and we share in it. Uh, it is a communion of the blood of Christ. We receive and we become participants in the benefits uh, that are asked through the blood of Christ. Uh, so it's a communion in the blood of Christ and a communion in the body of Christ uh, so that we all become a part of the body of Christ. So as we uh, receive the body of Christ, we all are saying that we are one spiritually when we all share in this body uh, that belongs to Christ. So we we'll continue from there. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll be back. Thank you.